Welcome to the Faster Podcast by Flow Cycling, the podcast where we talk about anything and everything that makes you faster on your bike. This is episode 16, and today we have Dr. Sharon Bayoun joining us on the show. Dr. Bayoun is a licensed OBGYN and triathlete who competes on the world stage. During this episode, we'll discuss how women can manage endurance training and pregnancy all the way from conception to the postnatal period. We'll also discuss other women's health concerns surrounding endurance sports. For our male listeners, we've got plenty for you as well. Dr. Bayoun presents men with a long list of tips on how to best support the women in our lives during pregnancy and what not to do in the delivery room. Dr. Sharon Bayoun, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Awesome. You are joining us from Florida, is that correct? That's right. And how's your weather? Uh well, actually, yesterday I went swimming. It was 70 degrees and the pool was empty and the lifeguard said it was because it was too cold for us in Florida to swim. Really? Yeah. Okay. And you're you're not near the hurricane, are you at all? No. We're north central Florida, so we're relatively protected, fortunately, from hurricanes. Okay. Awesome. And you just returned from the ITU World Champs, did you not? I did. Last month, it was great. Yeah, I, I were friends on Facebook, and I was a little jealous of some of your pictures that <laughs> yeah, you were putting up. Yeah, the Great Barrier up. Reef was pretty amazing. Yes, and how did you do? Uh, I was 33rd age group, but you know, my age group, all the former pros and elites are 45 to 49 now, so the woman who... <laughs> One, my age group was, um, I want to say Michelle Dixon, and she oh, wow. was sixth in the Olympics in 2004. She won the entire field for the women. So um, I'm going to be 50 next year, and if I had raced 50 to 54, I would have been 12th. So I'm looking forward to turning 50. Wow. Well, that's yeah. amazing. It's, it's so. crazy that al- or athletes of that caliber are allowed to compete in the age group ranks. Yeah. You know, last year when I raced in Rotterdam, the woman who won was McKelly Jones, who was, <laughs> you know, she won silver in Sydney in 2000. And some people complained that um, people of that caliber were competing age group. But to me, you know, I'm excited to have people to, to say that I'm in that same race with them. I'm certainly not competing with them, but to have them in that same wave is pretty exciting. I mean, she had, her athlete had won gold in the visually impaired division in Rio in 2016. So, you know, she's still competing at a high level. Um, Yeah. That's amazing. I, yeah. I've raced McKeeley and I will say that she beat me. So <laughs> <laughs> it was close, yeah. but she got me. She got yeah. me. At the, at well, it wasn't finish. close for me, but yeah. there, there we go. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, she's great. She's from this area, so she's yeah. really good. All right. Well, we are uh, very honored to have you on the show today. You are an OBGYN. You are obviously uh, a very accomplished triathlete, and we want you here because uh, we are all uh, here on earth because of the miracle of birth. And um, in my grandmother's generation and even my mother's generation, few women were participating in sports. Um, And in the latter part of the 20th century, you know, and even now into this century, more and more women are getting into cycling and athletics and running and triathlon. And um, this is something that's that's kind of new for women. I hate to say it, but it, it is in some ways. So our show is about being faster. And while I certainly recognize that women will not be faster in their third trimester, um, I wanted to discuss how women can safely mix exercise and pregnancy to keep themselves and their baby healthy during that process. Um, and then for women who are returning to racing, uh, the advice that we share today will help them make sure that they return to the sport and as healthy as they can. Um, so, and then finally, for the guys who are listening to this, we have a lot of men who listen. I wanted this episode to help us understand how we can support our significant others during their pregnancies. So, um, let's get right into it. Let's start with uh, fertility. And my understanding is that a woman's fertility increases when they are generally healthy. This means eating well, uh, drinking less alcohol, losing excess body fat, and reducing stress. Is it safe to say that the right amount of exercise increases a woman's fertility? So um, it's probably not necessarily the right amount of exercise. I mean, ultimately, a woman's fertility is going to depend on several factors. One is her age. Two is having normal ovulatory functions. So you have to be able to ovulate. And the third is having healthy fallopian tubes. And so, you know, in order for a woman to spontaneously or naturally conceive, her ovaries need to be able to release healthy eggs for fertilization, and her tubes need to be able to transport a fertilized egg to the uterus. So, you know, b- being significantly overweight or underweight, which can be related to poor diet, can affect ovulation. 
And then, you know, I always think of stress as being a little bit relative. I mean, you know, how people perceive stress and what's real and perceived can be different. But, you know, if stress is so significant that it's going to impact normal hormonal function and ovulation, okay. then that's what's going to impact uh, fertility. Okay. So basically, um, you know, as endurance athletes, we do push ourselves to the limit. So you're saying if we push ourselves too hard and the stress goes up too high, that will lower our a woman's chance for fertility. Yeah. I mean, if it's suppressing things to the point that it's stopping your menstrual cycles altogether, then obviously that's going to impact, you know, fertility. You know, in terms of alcohol, you mentioned alcohol, you know, it's recommended that women in general not consume greater than one drink a day. And, and in the U.S., what that equates to is about one 12-ounce beer, uh, a five-ounce glass of wine, or a shot of um, 80-proof alcohol. But I okay. think- Alcohol consumption in and of itself isn't going to cause infertility, but excessive consumption obviously can lead to other health problems. Okay. So then for women who are trying to uh, conceive a child, what would be your best general advice um, for the, for an athletic woman? So, you know, if you're healthy, if you're having regular monthly cycles, I mean, I think that the issue is, is that, you know, women spend a significant period of time in their lives trying not to get pregnant. And then when they finally get to that point in their lives when they're like, all right, we're ready to plan a family, then you think, oh, it's just going to happen just like that. I've been trying not for it to not happen for a while, and now I'm ready, so let's go. And I think that it becomes stressful when, um, you know, a woman doesn't conceive right within that first month of trying. And, you know, most people with regular cycles that are healthy should conceive within a year of attempting conception. So, you know, my advice would be to try to relax. You know, I think a lot of people in your, um, your audience are kind of type A type people. And <laughs> I think you, you don't want to make it a project and try to have fun. I would say that if somebody's a little bit older and, you know, in the obstetric world, we start to get concerned about age related to obstetrics, you know, mid thirties and beyond to use a little bit of a cutoff. You okay. know, if you haven't conceived after six months of trying, or certainly if you're somebody who's not having regular periods, then that type of person might want to seek some medical advice or even consider using like an ovulation prediction kit over the counter to help with um, conception. Interesting. So you, you mentioned that it's normal for it to take about a year to conceive. Well, we would expect most couples to conceive. And, you know, let's not um, forget the fact that in, in order to conceive, you know, between a man and a woman, the, the guy has a little bit of a contribution here. So if a couple's not conceiving, you know, you want to make sure that both sides of the equation are getting checked out, not just to assume that the fertility issue is the woman. Okay. But Obviously, my expertise is not in terms of male infertility. So, right, right. Um, <laughs> I have a good friend of mine's a urologist. We're going to have him on. Yeah, so my husband's a urologist him. actually oh, okay. too. So we have a little bit of a commonality there. But nice. Okay. Yeah. So there's a, a huge emphasis on put on women's body weight. You hear a lot of things about BMI, body fat percentage, scale weight, all those sorts of things. Can you define what a healthy body weight is or body composition for women? Yeah, so um, I am a fan of Stacey Sims, and I know she talked about body composition when she was a guest on one of your recent podcasts. And I think, you know, for athletes, knowing your body composition provides perhaps more useful information than just BMI because it includes more information, your weight, your BMI, body fat, an estimate of calories burned at rest and hydration. And But I, I do think it's also helpful to know your body type. You know, are you an ectomorph, a mesomorph, or an endomorph? And not necessarily just focus on the number of the, on the scale. Um, but, you know, BMI is still helpful to measure, I think, generally speaking. And in medicine, we classically use BMI to define um, a healthy weight for a given height. BMI between 20 to 24 being normal. And, you know, the Institute of Medicine even has guidelines for healthy weight gain during pregnancy based on pre-pregnancy BMI. And, you know, as you probably know, but you don't encounter so much in your world, obesity is a serious epidemic in the U.S. And, you know, according to the U.S. as of 2016, the percentage of Americans who are overweight is 71.6 percent, almost 40 percent wow. are considered to be obese. And this, you know, percentage continues to rise. Um, and so, you know, many women are concerned about excessive weight gain or sometimes not enough weight gain during pregnancy. And I tell them to try not to focus so much, not just on the number of the scale, but really even more so what their diet consists of. 
So, you know, if a woman is already at a healthy weight, is eating a clean diet consisting of whole foods, fresh fruit and vegetables, lean protein, and healthy carbs and fat, I don't want her to stress too much about her weight gain. But, you know, if she's consuming a lot of processed food and sugar, then we need to address that. Right. So you have to take more than just, you know, BMI or body composition into uh, account. And do you see anything talking about food? It's interesting. I've been doing a lot of re- research into food myself. Um, if you look at somebody who is eating a lot of, let's say, refined sugars, uh, processed foods versus somebody who's eating like fruits and vegetables, you know, good meats, those sorts of things. Do you see any differences in fertility between those two women? Um, I think probably it's going to ultimately, you know, if it's causing problems with ovulation, that's what's going to, and it's hard to necessarily know exactly how the two are completely tied, but I think that there's going to be more, you know, obesity issues and people who have poor diets like that, that will be more disruptive to normal ovulation. But it is amazing to me. Um, you would be amazed at the seemingly unhealthy people who seem to have no problems with conception. <laughs> yeah. And whereas other people that are like the picture of health um, struggle. <laughs> and so it doesn't completely line up. It really doesn't. So eating a good diet is obviously something that's going to help uh, with a woman's compo- uh, body composition. And, and working out well, are there any other things that we can think of that will help with a woman's body composition, something like uh, supplements or getting a good enough rest, anything like that that you would recommend? I mean, I think rest is important. You know, people that are sleep deprived tend to have higher cortisol levels, you know, the stress hormone. And and I think that when you have higher circulating stress hormone, it actually leads to cravings to yep. for foods that are not necessarily help, healthy for you. Yep. Um, so certainly that, that can contribute. Perfect. Okay. And do you have any signs or symptoms for a woman who is, who's working out a lot and all of a sudden they've lost too much weight? Are there any identifiers that would, that would tell a woman that, hey, maybe you need to put a little bit more weight back on? Yeah, I mean, certainly the biggest indicator, I think, is if you start having problems with menstrual irregularity or if you completely stop having your periods. Obviously, yep. this is assuming you're not on any sort of hormonal birth control or using a, a progestin IUD, you know, and, and maybe you need to consider it if you're having problems with recurrent stress fractures, um, something that might suggest, you know, bone bone density issues. Okay. And what is the main reason that a woman will stop her menstrual cycle if she's lost too much weight, does it have to do with body fat or, or what, what is, what is the reason for that? I mean, it's really the, the signaling in your body that helps with menstrual regulation starts in the brain with your hypothalamus down to your okay. pituitary that then signals down to your ovary. So in times of, of severe uh, malnutrition or weight loss, I mean, your body is naturally going to shut that process down because uh, you're not going to be considered to be healthy enough to grow a healthy a baby in there. Wow. So, I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's a natural process if, if, uh, if your body weight has decreased to the point that you can't support a healthy pregnancy. Okay. Hmm. That makes sense. Um, evolution at its finest, I guess. That right. makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've had a couple friends over the years that would have talked about female athlete triad syndrome. Can you explain this and how women can prevent it? Okay. So, you know, I think when people think of this triad, they think of it as existing on the extreme of disordered eating coupled with somebody who stops getting their period and having um, low bone density. And, you know, the classic mental image that comes to mind is that of a gymnast or a ballerina or a marathon runner. But, um, you know, what this triad really refers to is the relationship between energy availability, menstrual function, and bone density. And And each component can exist on a spectrum of normal to abnormal. So, you know, inadequate energy availability may just be inadequate caloric intake for the level of energy expenditure in the form of exercise, or it can be at the extreme of a true um, eating disorder. And then, you know, menstrual function can still be normal, but it could exist at the extreme of just shutting everything down and stopping getting your periods. And, you know, that's usually in the setting of a low estrogen state, which leads to low bone density. So I think the thing that's important to exclude are other causes of not having a period. So, you know, I don't want to get into a whole endocrinology lecture, but you at least (laughs) want to exclude pregnancy. So the first thing that we're going to do as OBs, if a woman comes in and says, hey, I haven't got my period, take a pregnancy test. 
And then, you know, you could have thyroid dysfunction. There are less common causes like prolactin hormone secreting tumors, or some women can enter into premature menopause. Um, sometimes there can be some sort of anatomic or structural blockage that's preventing a woman to have a period. But, um, you know, in terms of prevention, it really has to do with balancing the durational level of intensity of training with nutritional intake. So, you know, if your nutritional intake is inadequate and your training is intense, this can lead to menstrual irregularities. But the problem is how much is too much and how much nutritional intake is too little is just not really that well studied. Um, you know, prevention or correcting the problem can be as simple as taking in more calories and gaining some weight, but certainly it can be more complicated if there's disordered eating involved. Okay. okay. Very cool. Interesting. Let's talk about conception. So... Uh, a lot of endurance athletes, maybe a bit type A, have pretty yes. pretty intense schedules. Everything's scheduled down to the last minute. Um, for a woman trying to conceive, is there a good time to try and conceive considering they're putting in a lot of workouts? Is it better to try and conceive before a workout, after a workout, recovery days, easy days? Is there any science behind that or anything you could give advice on? I mean... I would say probably don't overthink it. I, the 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 <laughs> main the main the main criteria for conception is you have to be ovulating. Right. So you know whether it's an easy day or a hard day really shouldn't impact ovulation unless it's stopping you from ovulating for you know too too intensive a training program. But okay. you just have to be ovulating. So okay. really, it's just timed around that. Perfect. Awesome. All right. Let's jump into some questions uh, to do with training while pregnant. So um, I'm assuming that the the answer to these questions may differ depending on the trimester that the woman is in. So if it makes sense for you to answer them, you know, based on a trimester basis, feel free to do that. Um, so does the right type of exercise during pregnancy have a health benefit for, for the baby? Um, and if so, what benefits does it have for the baby? Okay. So, you know, in general, a healthy mom is going to mean a healthy baby. And most types of exercises are safe for mom and baby, unless the exercise is going to put the mom at risk for a traumatic injury, whether from having a high risk of falling or some other blunt trauma through contact sports or something like that. Okay. Um, you know, in terms of trimester, I would say, you know, for the first trimester, you know, the biggest issue with um, training and exercise in the first trimester is um, if a woman is going to experience intense nausea or vomiting or extreme fatigue, and that might limit their exercise tolerance. Okay. But, you know, if a woman's feeling okay in the first trimester, I would say do whatever do whatever you want. I mean, the main restriction I would say is try not to get overheated and to stay well hydrated. I mean, there are some concerns about having sustained core temperatures above like 101 or 102 and some risks to the baby. Okay. But um, I would say generally speaking in the first trimester, the biggest limiter is going to be that you just might not have the same level of, um, of uh, endurance or intensity if you're really tired or if you're having issues with nausea and vomiting. Okay. Uh, for the women who do, or do you, you want to go to the third trimester now? Sorry, I cut sure, you off. Sure, sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Well, yeah. I mean, the second trimester, I'll say, is generally like, the best trimester for everything. You know, you don't have all the nausea, vomiting, fatigue, and you don't have as many of the physical discomforts. Okay. Um, you know, the uterus does start to increase in size and you might have to restrict some of your activity. You know, I get a little concerned about women road cycling after, you know, 20 weeks or so. You, you just don't want to have a fall on the bike and hit your belly and cause, yeah. you know, yeah. problems. And I would say, you know, in the third trimester that certainly extends into that, um, you know, no contact sports. I mean, I've had rugby, rugby players, downhill skiers, you know, horseback riding, you know, you name it. I mean, those activities are definitely going to have to be limited. Um, you know, I would say in the third trimester, I would recommend that women consider working with like a pelvic floor physical therapist and do some strengthening exercises. You know, balance becomes an issue. Um, back pain, back discomfort can be an issue. So you might want to work with a massage therapist or a chiropractor okay. or physical therapist. Um, you know, non-impact stuff like swimming um, are great. You know, 
biking on your trainer, fine. I mean, I still remember seeing this great picture of Sarah Haskins on her bike trainer yes. with her arrow bars like turned upright because she couldn't lean over anymore. <laughs> yep. um, so, you know, you just modify your activity. Okay, interesting. So basically, first trimester is pretty, pretty free. Second trimester, you want to get away from the impacts or risks of falling. And then third trimester is just do what you can. Right, exactly. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So for the women who do exercise during a pregnancy, does it help them um, after the delivery with recovery in any way? I mean, I would say, yeah, absolutely. The healthier you are during your pregnancy, the more active, the more likely and faster you're going to return to your pre-pregnancy fitness. I mean, we have a local athlete here who's, um, you know, just about due and she was running 13 miles last week. Um, you know, so it just depends. And, you know, she's in great shape. And, you know, most of her training days call for four to five hour workouts. I mean, she's zone one, zone two, um, when she's doing her runs, but I mean, she still can beat all of us in the pool, uh, <laughs> when we do our master swim group. So, um, you know, it's not slowing her down that much for her. That's relatively, amazing. Yes. Yeah. I, I swim with a master's team and a lady, uh, swam with us, uh, up until two days before delivery. And she was still fast. She beat us all. I couldn't yeah. believe it. It was incredible. She couldn't flip turn, but everything <laughs> else she could no, do. No, she's was... still flip turning. Oh, wow. really? Yeah, she's still flip turning. Wow, that's incredible. And she's 6'2", uh, so man, she just does these flip turns and she's gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People that tall dive in, they're already halfway across yeah, the pool. Exactly. So they're cheating, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so it, with respect to... Uh, volume. I, you know, we talked a little bit about intensity. You, you kind of step it down. But as far as volume goes for the for the women who are have a higher volume, should they step down the volume right away at once they become pregnant, or really is that get uh, more reduced as the as the pregnancy progresses? This is totally. It depends. It okay. totally depends. I mean, I think that women do need to listen to their bodies. And I would say, especially for the um, athletically competitive, you know, the previously competitive women, I think that the thing that they just have to get over the fact that they might not be as fast or be able to do the right. same level in, of intensity. But, you know, I've had people run full marathons in their first trimester. And like I said, you know, Elise was running 13 miles last week and feeling great. So okay. um, it really, really totally depends. Okay, so listen to your body is the old yeah. adage. Okay, okay, so this may be a bit of a wives' tale. Uh, you can correct me on this if I'm if I'm wrong, but I've I've heard that if you've if you've been athletic and you work out before a pregnancy, it's okay to work out once you've become pregnant. But if you didn't work out or didn't exercise before a pregnancy, that you shouldn't start while pregnant. Is this true? So. I would say no. You know, okay. the American College of OBGYN recommends at least 30 minutes of cardio at least five days a week. And this is a very generic and broad recommendation. But, you know, I think that if somebody's completely sedentary, you don't want to start ramping up into a very intense exercise training program. But if somebody's already physically active, by all means, I think that they should be able to continue what they're doing as long as, you know, if you're not having bleeding, if you're not having contractions. I mean, there are conditions that can occur during pregnancy for which, you know, certain exercise is really going to become a no-no. You know, if you have preterm labor, some women can develop high blood pressure in pregnancy. If you have bleeding, if you break your water early, you know, these are things that are going to um, take exercise off the table a little bit. But, okay. you know, in general, if a pregnant woman asks me for exercise advice, I like to just start by asking her what type of exercise she likes or wants to do. And, you know, the best exercise is the, is the one that she's going to get enjoyment from and want to incorporate into her routine. Okay. Um, and like I said, you know, my biggest, you know, caution is things that are going to put people at risk for, um, you know, traumatic injury. Okay. Okay. Excellent. What about uh, food? When you start looking at food, um, how many extra calories does a pregnant woman need? I'm assuming as the baby grows, that's going to increase. Well, um, really, it's just an additional one to 300 calories a day. I mean, you know, really? you're, you're not eating for two full <laughs> grown adults. You're eating I wasn't going to say that, but. And a baby. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's going to vary depending on somebody's resting metabolic rate and what her level of activity is. 
but, you know, we can talk about recommended weight gain. I mean, to put it in the simplest terms, if you take a normal weight person on average, we say gain 30 pounds for the pregnancy. So 10 pounds per trimester. Yeah. But, you know, some women are going to lose a little weight in the beginning if they don't have much of an appetite or having issues with nausea. Yeah. Most of the weight gain is going to occur in the third trimester. But in general, if you break it down to 10, 10, 10, then that's easy enough to remember. I've always gotten a kick out of the guys that I know that seem to put on more weight than their wives yes, when their wives are pregnant. Do. Yes, but the men do it. That's <laughs> that's the funny part. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is the healthy, you just explain that. So you're basically saying 10, 10 pounds per trimester is kind of a healthy Yeah, I mean, day. if you want to simplify it. I mean, so the more underweight you start out at the beginning of your pregnancy, the more the recommended total weight gain is going to be okay. versus if somebody's obese, um, sometimes we actually really recommend no weight gain or certainly no more than 15 pounds for the pregnancy. Right. And then, you know, if you have twins, then the the weight gain shift is going to be somewhere on the order of like 40 pounds total. Okay. okay. And is there anything that, that shows the actual composition of a, of a body, of a woman's body changing? So does, does her... Does her uh, body fat percentage go up during pregnancy? Is that supposed to stay the same? What happens in with, with that? I mean, you know, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I would say that your body fat percentage is going to increase with pregnancy compared to, okay. to non-pregnant. Okay. Perfect. All right. And is and there I, any? I certainly would. I certainly would not want a pregnant woman to worry about body composition in pregnancy. I mean, I tell women all the time. I'm, you know. Pregnancy is not a time to restrict calories or to diet. Right. Um, no. You know, <laughs> I, I, I really want to focus on healthy nutrition and um, try not to worry about the the number of pounds and certainly probably not the body composition either. I, I like that rule. I think as long as you're eating good, nutritious, healthy food, then you should let nature take its course. That's, yeah. that's yep. a really good piece of advice for yeah. sure. Yeah. Is there anything else a pregnant woman should know about exercise? Uh. I mean, I think the main thing is, um, you know, balance and center of gravity can um, change in the third trimester, so there may be increased risk of falling. I think, you know, there's something called lumbar lordosis in the third trimester, so carrying more weight in the front can increase risk of um, low back pain, strain, and injury. But, you know, there's so many benefits to exercise in pregnancy. It can decrease back aches, even though, you know, back pain becomes an issue in the third trimester, but it can help with constipation, bloating, swelling. Um, I am a huge fan of compression socks, um, pregnant or not pregnant. I just love compression socks, but with the <laughs> swelling, um, I, I always am encouraging women to go to the running store and get some compression socks. Um, you know, exercise is just great for health and mood. It can improve sleep quality, you know, improves muscle tone and strength, um, endurance. Um, oh, there can be more ligament laxity. So just, you know, be careful that you don't, you know, strain yourself. Some of the increased flexibility is a welcome change, but it also can potentially predispose to um, to injury. And like I said, you know, for people who are athletically competitive, just kind of get over the fact that you're not going to be, you know, winning all your races and just not being able to 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 do the same level of intensity as your non pregnant self and yeah you know I mentioned Elise and she's she was really um, sad that she had to sit out Kona this year but she still can beat us all in the pool even though it's turtle speed for her <laughs> and um, still go for these pretty good endurance <laughs> runs so that's that's amazing um, let's talk a little bit about returning to training post delivery um, delivery as we know takes quite a toll on the body so it's important in my I would guess it's important for women to return to exercise um, only when the time is right. So um, let's address these questions in terms of uh, a vaginal birth and then a C-section because I'm guessing your advice may be a little bit different. Um, how long should, let's start just start with how long should women wait before returning to exercise post-delivery? So, you know, in general, I don't recommend significant impact activities or anything too jarring on the pelvis for the first six to eight weeks after delivery. Okay. I know especially competitive athletes will return to their activity sooner than that, but you're just potentially setting yourself up for injury and then prolonging your return to what you really want to be doing. And at the very least, I would say I wouldn't recommend doing anything for the first two weeks after delivery. I mean, the first two weeks, all you should be focusing on are feeding the baby, feeding yourself, sleeping and changing diapers and okay. and walking. <laughs> so, you know, 
And that's where we come in, right? Yes, exactly. (laughs) I mean, honestly, for people that are used to being able to multitask, you have a newborn. And if you can take a shower by five o'clock that day on any given day, it's a major accomplishment. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So just lower your expectations a little bit, at least for the first two weeks. So when you said the high impact stuff, you're probably referring to running. So is swimming and cycling safer in those first six to eight weeks? Yeah, you probably don't want to jump in a pool within the first couple of weeks after having a vaginal birth or a cesarean, really, because you know, just the risks of infection, there's, well, first of all, there's still a lot of, you know, vaginal bleeding and discharge in the first couple of weeks. And then if you have a C-section, you know, you don't want to potentially risk um, infection in your incision and things like that. So I would say for the first couple of weeks, walk as much as you want. If you want to get on a stationary bike, you know, go ahead. Um, But I probably wouldn't start running right away. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, you actually just touched on this briefly, and one of the things that you know you can we've heard is that there is ligament uh, laxity. Can you explain mm-hmm. that a little bit more? And just you know, how long does that take to come back, and why does it happen? Just a bit more. Yeah, I mean, you know, your bony pelvis has you know ligaments that it, it's not just one solid piece of bone, and I would say the probably the most sensitive area for a lot of women is in between the pubic bone. There's a ligament in between the pubic symphysis, and um, you know, obviously, um, to accommodate for a vaginal childbirth, the pelvis yeah. sort of needs to be able to open up, and that area can become pretty sensitive and tender. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, it just um, any impact type stuff is repetitive jumping and things like that are going to just stress and be tender in that area. So, okay, perfect. Um, when women start to exercise again, I'm assuming that it's best for them to take things, take things very slowly. Can you give us some advice on how to safely return to exercise? Yeah. I mean, for running, I, you know, I always say start with run walk intervals. I mean, anybody who's going to come back from a running injury or whatever, you're going to not just go out and go for a tempo run right away. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of run walk intervals. And I'll say, you know, walk for four, jog for one, walk for four, jog for one, do that for, you know, 20 to 30 minutes, and then just adjust the interval until you're jogging or, you know, walking or jogging more comfortably for a 20 minute, um, you know, consistent duration, and then you can build up your volume again. Okay. But I, you know, I'd almost treat it the same way you would as if you were coming back from a, a running injury. Okay. And do you have any warning signs for women returning uh, that maybe they've taken it a bit too far, or they need to take some more time off? Yeah, I mean, I think pain, pain. you know, we say all the time in ortho, well, we in ortho as if I'm an ortho, but, you know, <laughs> let pain be your guide. I mean, I've I heard that so many times before from um, orthopedic people, and so maybe that's why I'm stealing that phrase. But, you know, you want to let your pain, um, you know, pain be your guide, basically. Okay, okay. Um, so, obviously, pregnancy changes a woman's body. Um, what are some permanent or temporary changes that women should be aware of post-pregnancy? So I would say one that could be potentially distressing to women is bladder control issues. Okay. Um, so sometimes bladder control is not super great uh, immediately after delivery. Um, and for most people, that's temporary. Um, a lot of women I know like to do pelvic floor strengthening exercises even during pregnancy to help um, uh, limit that a little bit after delivery. But um, that can always be something that can be addressed after delivery as well. Um, okay. I think balance issues can be um, a problem. One of the pieces of advice I tell women all the time is don't carry your baby or your child just on one hip. I feel like women get lopsided because, you know, if you're right-handed, you're going to carry your kid on your left hip so that you can have your right hand free to do whatever. But it definitely messes with your balance and your hip strength on either side. Um, So to try to, you know, not do that. Okay. That's some great advice. So in general, women just need to be patient with themselves, I think, because a lot of our, our audience is, like you said, the type A athlete who wants right. to get everything done. Okay. Interesting. And then this, how about, so this leads to the men. Um, what is the best <laughs> advice you can give to the guys listening to this episode? Um, how can we best support the women in our lives and what should we definitely not be doing <laughs> during <laughs> our, our wives or significant others' pregnancy? So I, I think it, it's during the pregnancy and then at the time of delivery and then after the baby is born. So I would break okay. it down into those things. Let's and do that. so so in the first trimester, you know, nausea and vomiting can be 
really horrible. And I will tell you, true story, um, you know, I had pretty bad nausea and vomiting during my first trimester, really until 16 weeks. And I would throw up in between seeing patients after delivering a baby. And, (laughs) you know, it got so bad that it was causing some other bodily function issues. But anyway, I had tried some over-the-counter options. Then I moved on to prescription medications. And finally, I I got a prescription for Zofran, which is an anti-nausea medication. And at the time, there was not a generic option. It was actually pretty expensive. And so, you know, my husband goes to the pharmacy to get this medication for me. And he's he's very well-meaning, supportive, but also very cost-conscious and very practical. (laughs) So he goes to pick up the prescription and the pharmacist tells him how much it costs. (laughs) And he, he literally, he hesitated and he looked at the pharmacist and he goes, how much would it be if I just bought a couple of the pills? <laughs> because, I mean, the other ones weren't really working. So can I try out a couple of them? And then, you know, that way I don't have to spend. Anyway, so he bought the whole prescription. Um, and I don't remember this, but according to him, apparently my nausea completely resolved after I took like only two of them. And he's like, you know, that costs like a couple hundred dollars. So he started trying to give it away to his friends whose wow. wives were having nausea because he didn't want the money to go to waste, but oh, no. I would say if your significant other is having bad nausea and vomiting, it's terrible. I mean, I think nausea is like the worst feeling in the world. So oh, me too. Just, just do what she needs to help her um, overcome that. <laughs> and then um, fatigue in the first trimester is also really um, pretty um, remarkable. And you know, your your wife did not all of a sudden become the world's laziest human being on the planet. I mean, women <laughs> will want to nap all day because it's so exhausting. It's a real thing. So, you know, I would say this is when you want to pitch in if you're not already in terms of doing the dishes and the laundry, cleaning the house, cooking the dinner, doing the shopping. I mean, you know, help out when, when she's pretty knocked out with fatigue. Yeah. Um, the good news is, is that having sex is totally fine. Okay. It will not cause a miscarriage. Um, you know, some people get nervous about having sex during pregnancy. There's really, unless somebody has preterm labor, their water broke early, um, you know, there are certain issues when it's not going to be okay, but I would say in most cases it's fine. Sometimes it can cause a little bit of light bleeding or spotting, so don't panic if that happens, but, you know, she should call her doctor for advice. Okay. Um, I would say in the second trimester, it's the best time to travel. So if you're going to plan, people call it a baby moon, not a honeymoon, but a baby moon. Um, okay. It's really the best time to travel. I would say, you know, cruises have a 24 to 25 week gestation cutoff, after which they don't allow women to travel on cruises. So um, plan your travel around that. Uh, airlines restrict flying after 36 weeks on domestic um, continental flights. Um, so, you know, as you can imagine, they don't want to divert a flight for a woman who might go into labor. So I would say for any trips that you're going to plan, consider getting travel insurance just in case some you know pregnancy complication occurs. But second trimester is generally going to be the best time to travel. Okay. And then, you know, third trimester, you know, back pain is pretty universal and sleep quality can be um, pretty bad. So I would consider, you know, booking a massage or, you know, giving a massage. Some massage places will require a doctor's note saying that it's okay to get a a prenatal massage. So just check um, and uh, make sure that they don't need a note. And then, you know, I do think it would be a good idea to attend a childbirth education class, especially if it's your first baby. Um, You know, I think on some level, it's hard for some guys to have the same level of anticipation of having a baby for the obvious reason that you're not experiencing all the physical symptoms and changes of pregnancy. But, you know, it's not to say that you're not every bit as excited or nervous or happy about it. It's just, you know, it's just a different experience. Um, You know, and then for the actual delivery experience... Um, you know, most women don't really eat or drink anything once they're admitted to a hospital and labor. And I'm always amazed when I go into a room and I'll see a woman and like her partner's sitting there eating a full course meal <laughs> in front of her, which maybe <laughs> she may not mind, but you might want to consider the fact that she's kind of hungry and you're eating in front of her yeah. um, and maybe not eat in front of her. Um, but I think the whole delivery experience is pretty su- surreal because it's a whole lot of nothing happening. You know, you're sitting there listening to the baby's heart rate on the monitor, and then all of a sudden it's it's time to go. And um, 
I think my favorite thing that happens during the delivery experience is when the guys cry. When the guys cry when the baby is born, it's like tears of joy is the best thing to see and just, you know, cut the cord and and just be happy and, you know, it's 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 really the best thing. I I, I believe I will be I have not had a child yet. I you think you would cry? To, oh, I Oh, I if will. If I don't, yeah. I'm going to be like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like getting choked up thinking about it right now. And yeah. I, I, yeah. I love that. It makes me so oh. happy when I see the guys cry for yeah. good reason. Uh, yes. And then after pregnancy, what can, what can we do to not? So <laughs> to not cry? To not screw up. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the first thing to recognize is that, and, and I'm, I'm being very general, maybe some of it's from personal experience, but, um, you're, sometimes you're going to feel like you, you don't know what to do. I mean, especially if your if your partner is breastfeeding, you know, you, you can't feed the baby, and so if the baby's crying, you know, she's going to be the first path to comforting the baby and taking care of the baby. So sometimes you feel like you, you don't really know what you should be doing. But the first two weeks after delivery, by far, are a huge adjustment. I mean, postpartum blues affect about seventy percent or more of women after delivery. There are okay. a lot of hormonal changes sleep deprivation. You know, she might cry for no apparent reason. And this is really pretty typical and normal. Um, you know, and the adjustment of caring for a newborn who's dependent on you 24-7 is a huge life adjustment. You know, especially for the athletic woman in your life, you know, endorphins are huge when you're exercising and then all of a sudden that's gone, plus you're taking care of a baby, plus you're not sleeping. Um, you know, major depression even can also occur. So if you're concerned that that's an issue, then you get, you know you need to contact the doctor. But um, and then the other thing with breastfeeding is that um, for some people, it just doesn't natural come naturally or as easily to some women and their babies, and it can be painful in the beginning. So okay. um, I think that that's a situation where it's hard for a guy not to know where his role should be. Um, for sure, because you know if the baby's crying at night. And a woman's breastfeeding, you're gonna. Ha- she's the one that's gonna have to get up. But um, I would say the first two weeks, you know, just be as supportive as you can. Um, lots of communication um, is really important, and and just realize that she might not seem like her normal self to you, but sh- she will come back. It might just take a couple of weeks. Of course. Um, okay, and then and then so those that is excellent advice. I, yeah. I really appreciate all that. So one one thing that I I think of um, too is. I think during pregnancy, there's obviously there's a lot of hormonal things going on and emotions and post-pregnancy, you, you mentioned the postpartum depression and, and all of these types of things. Um, I think a lot of guys assume the role of support, support, and do whatever we can. And sometimes maybe we are uh, oblivious to a, a real problem. What are some things that we should, I hate to say the word, put our foot down, but make sure that we're getting help if, if, if there is a, a true risk you know, presenting itself. Yeah. So, I mean, for the depression aspect, like I said, for the first two weeks after delivery, some tearfulness and, you know, crying for no apparent reason um, would be considered to be normal. Certainly, if that's extending beyond that two-week period, you know, if you feel like she's got no interest in helping to care for the baby um, or feed the baby or is not you know, taking care of her herself in some way. Okay. I mean, um, you know, it's it's hard to be really specific in that environment, but you know, hopefully, you know your significant other to know it, it's not just she seems a little bit sad. Okay. And you know. during pregnancy, are there any warning signs that we should definitely you know have a look out for? I would say hormonal changes and mood related stuff probably isn't so much going to be a factor during the pregnancy. I would say the biggest issue that I see come up during pregnancy is um, it can certainly um, prompt some anxiety in women. I think that the thing about pregnancy is that, um, you know, for a woman who's used to being in control of the situation, in control of her body and what's happening, pregnancy sort of poses the situation or at least an anticipation of the delivery when they're going to have like not complete control over what's going on with them. And that can be really anxiety provoking for some people. Okay. Um, So, um, yeah, I think it's just a matter of feeling like they can have their concerns addressed by their 
their physician more so probably than for you, but it might be helpful for you to attend a prenatal appointment with her so that you can hear the same information. Um, okay. You know, some guys I see go to every single prenatal appointment. I think that's great. It's probably not practical for people who have to work during the day all the time. And, um, you know, I think that the decision to do that is just up to the, the individual couple. Good. So we should be supportive, communicate openly, and be as educated as we can. And don't eat in the delivery room. Yes, don't eat. Yes. <laughs> okay. <yes. laughs> Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So th uh, this is our last question. We ask this to every guest on the show. It's called our what point question. And the idea is if the listener follows all of the advice in the podcast given to us by the expert yourself, um, how many watts is that worth? Now, I know this is, this is pregnancy and I know it's a bit different, but I want to try and keep with the tradition of the show. So yes. uh, I'm sure you're familiar with watts, right? Yes. Okay. So if a woman... Uh, you know, is training and racing and she follows absolutely none of your advice or she follows all of your advice with eating healthy and giving your body time to recover and all of those things and she returns to training. How many watts do you think that is worth? Uh, you can I use mean, a percentage. <laughs> it's, this is just a ballpark. It's, how do you assign watt points to having a baby? I mean... <laughs> no, it's, it's more about taking care of your body and being healthy. So if you if you really abuse your body during during a pregnancy... How much of an, uh, a detriment can that have to your physical health when you return? I mean, I think that it's just like any sort of, um, you know, training. If you tr try to train through injury, you just make yourself worse. I think that we can learn some lessons from some of the elite athletes that we've seen coming back after okay. having a baby. I mean, look at Miranda Carfrey and Meredith Kessler and Sarah Haskins and, you know, Gwen Jorgensen, obviously she's transitioned to running, but I mean, they are every bit as strong, if not stronger than they were, um, before they had their babies. And so I almost would pose the question to them to see wh where their, their watt points are okay. percentage wise, um, compared to before they had the baby. But, um, I so would, we'll go, I would go say ahead. you should at least be back to your pre-pregnancy wattage and then um, can just build from there. I mean, that's sort of not what you're looking for in terms of percentage increase. But, no, 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 um, no, no. That's, that's, that's excellent. I yeah. will say that you, that was, you probably had one of the toughest answers of that question on the podcast. <laughs> so you handled it very well. So we'll just say that a woman should be able to, if she does things right and keeps herself healthy, should be able to return to pre-pregnancy fitness. Exactly. Awesome. Well, um, this has been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Um, if, if people want to learn more about you and your practice, uh, how can they do that? So I am on the faculty at the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida. So, um, you know, if they look up University of Florida OBGYN, they can certainly find me there. Okay. Um, and uh, I would say that that would probably be the easiest way to, to connect with me. I'm happy to share my I don't know my email. If you want me to share my email, sure. Um, yeah, if, that's, if you're comfortable with it's, that, yeah. Um, S is in Sam. B Y U N is in Nancy at ufl.edu. Okay. Um, and if they want to put in the subject heading "Flow Cycling Podcast" or "Faster Podcast," um, yeah, then I'll be more likely to <laughs> to answer to them. respond. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I, I can't thank you enough. I, I think this is a topic that, you know, could get, should get covered more. And uh, you've been an excellent, uh, you know, wealth of information for us. And I wish you all the best in your future triathlons because you're a very good athlete as well. And uh, again, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks. I want to thank you for actually choosing to have this topic. It makes me, I'm thrilled to have had the chance to talk to you. So thank you. Great. Yeah. Have a great day. All right. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Yep. Thank you for listening to this episode. Be sure to listen to episode 17, where we interviewed Jim Manton from Aero Sports to learn how bike fit and real world aero testing in a velodrome can help you become a faster cyclist. If you enjoyed the show, please help us by sharing our podcast and by leaving a rating or review. If you want to learn more about our company, Flow Cycling, please visit us online at flowcycling.com. That's F as in Frank, L O C Y C. L I N G dot com. You can also find us under Flow Cycling on Facebook and Instagram. Until next time, ride safe.